the Lord. We glorify you, Father. We bless you. We thank you for your presence with us today. And we thank you, Father, that Jesus is alive. That the victory that he won on the cross, the victory that he won through his own precious blood applies to each and every one of us. And Father, no matter what we're dealing with right now, no matter what we're facing in our lives, and certainly what we're facing in the world around us, we thank you that your love is greater. And we thank you, Lord, that you are coming soon. And Lord, until you come, we are the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are not the weak, fallen, broken people of God holding on until you come to save us. We are the kingdom of God on earth. We are victorious. We are powerful. We are washed in the blood of Jesus. We are filled with the love of God. And we are the church and the gates of hell will not prevail against us. Hallelujah. We thank you that we always have the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And we celebrate that today in the name of Jesus. And Father, as the shepherd of this church and of this flock, for those that are local and those who are watching from different places around the earth, I speak blessing over the body of Christ. I speak hope and faith and life right now. And I take authority and dominion over Satan, evil spirits, every dark force, every fear that would assault the body of Christ. And in the name of Jesus, I set you free right now. I fill your heart, your mind, your home with the peace of God that passes all understanding. Hallelujah. Those that are struggling under a burden of guilt, I declare this day that Jesus went to the cross. He took your infirmity. He carried your shame. He took your sins and he took them to the grave. And the Bible says that when he raised from the dead, you were raised with him free. Receive his grace right now, his love, his mercy, his resurrection power, his healing power. Receive it in your mind, in your body, in your soul, in your home, in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. I release that blessing, that love, that glory that belongs to the body of Christ right now among everyone who's watching in Jesus mighty name amen amen praise the Lord well the Bible says you and I have been blessed with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ Jesus right now we are the blessed of the Lord so I just want you to say that regardless of what you're thinking or feeling or going through just take your hands put them on your on your own body and just say I am the blessed of the Lord yes you are blessed coming in and blessed going out the head and not the tail above and not beneath hallelujah and what God is blessed no man can curse in Jesus name we want to welcome you today to Abundant Life. It is great to have you with us in this midsummer season. And uh, we're continuing to have church at home and church online. And so I just want to remind you, church is not canceled. Church has been happening ever since uh, we have not been able to gather physically in our main campus. We are still the Church of Jesus Christ, and great things are happening. Just this week, I got several letters from people, not only locally, but a number of letters from folks that have been watching every week, uh, really since March, from different parts of the country. I got a letter from a dear woman in New Hampshire who's been watching every week, and the words that uh, we have uh, given have been a blessing and a direction and a help to her. We received a praise report of somebody who was watching uh, just a few weeks ago, and I called out a word of uh, knowledge about healing, and they were instantly healed as they heard that word from God. So the Holy Spirit is moving in these services, and he's moving because remember, in the realm of the Spirit, there is no distance. Uh, we are all one. Though we're not physically in the same space, we are spiritually in the same space. And because of that, the same Holy Spirit that's on me, that's in this place right now, is with you wherever you are, and he's going to move. Even as I minister the word today, I expect the Holy Spirit to move in your home, in your car, wherever you are, the Holy Spirit's going to touch your life. And whatever you need from God, I'm expecting you're going to receive it 
in the mighty name of Jesus. So get your expectations lifted. I'd encourage you to turn off every other notification, distraction, and do your very best as a family. If you're with a family or with others in your home, just sit and let the Holy Spirit minister this word to you today. Praise the Lord. Well, this morning, uh, I want to build on some of the things that we've been talking about. Last week, we talked about the importance of how to play catch, how to make sure that we're in a position to listen in especially difficult and stressful times. You know, the Bible says, let every one of us be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get angry. For the anger of man, or human anger, does not produce the righteous results of God. Uh, God doesn't accomplish his will through human wrath. He accomplishes it through really understanding and listening. And it's really not until we've understood what someone else is thinking or saying or feeling that we're in a position to really address it and help them to grow and for us to grow as well. So we talked about that and we talked about the fact that listening is like playing catch, not dodgeball. That means each part, each party has to be in a receptive place uh, and has to learn how to throw the particular ball that's being thrown. So I want to just for a minute, let that sit. And I want to talk for a few moments about something that I think is very, very important. You know, the underlying principle of the Christian life is relationship. And the maintenance of relationship is more important than really any other thing in the Bible. If if you think about it, we, we, most of us are familiar with the Ten Commandments, the first ten big laws that God gave the human race on Mount Sinai. And if you look at the Ten Commandments, those commandments are relationship commandments or laws. They're they're principles for how we should govern our relationships. First of all, with God, we should love Him above all else. Uh, We should honor Him with our time. That's what the Sabbath commandment is. We should, and then we should honor one another by not violating others' boundaries and by learning to live together. Relationship is really the core essence of growth in the kingdom of God. And when we learn how to do relationship with God and one another well, we're in the greatest possible position for the blessing of God to operate in our lives. Now right now, in this world, we are dealing in a time, or living in a time, where relationships are being attacked, where human, uh, human interaction and connection is being destroyed along all kinds of lines. Uh, there is hostility, there's anger, there's blame, there's accusation. There are folks who are living, in, uh, uh, living with great and deep pain. There are people that are also in pain. And in many ways, uh, people are not listening or understanding each other and relationships are beginning to disintegrate. And what's really troubling, we know these things will happen in the world, but what's really troubling is when these things happen in the body or in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I've spent a lot of time of my life studying the New Testament, and in particular, the letters that are written to the churches. Because of all the scripture, all the material in the Bible, from the Old Testament through the New Testament, the most pertinent and most uh, vital information for a New Testament Christian, a believer and follower of Jesus today, are the statements that God gave to Christians in the New Testament in the letters to the churches. The four Gospels are powerful, and they're written to us about the life and the ministry of Jesus. And they're written to win people to the life of Jesus. But the letters that are in the New Testament, the letters of Paul in particular, Peter and James, we call these the epistles. That just means the letters. They were written by the apostles to the first Christians to give them directions about how to actually live out the values that Christ taught, how to live the Christian life. And if you go through these letters, and they start in the book of Romans and go all the way through to the little book of Jude, you'll discover that there are directives, commandments, we could say. Uh, they're, They're principles that are given and directives that Christians are supposed to live by. And what's remarkable, and I have spent a lot of time doing this, if you go through all of these directives telling us how we should live our Christian life, you will discover that over 90% 
of the information and the directives that is recorded in those letters to Christians have to do with how Christians treat, hold on for it, one another. Now, why is that important to think about? Well, you'd think if God is speaking through the apostles to Christians, he'd be telling them how they should interact with God, their relationship with God. And certainly, that's a theme throughout all of the letters because it's very important that our relationship with God is thriving. But if you look at the actual directions and commandments, this is how you live, this is how you behave, uh, it's remarkable because 90% of the directives in the New Testament are about how Christians are supposed to behave towards one another, not even how we are supposed to behave towards those who are outside. Even though there are directions and specific statements in Scripture about what our relationship should be with people who don't know the Lord, that's actually at a minimal. In fact, if you were to go through the New Testament and the letters and look for everything that teaches us how to evangelize lost people, you'd be amazed to discover that there's not a lot of material. Now, that doesn't mean we shouldn't evangelize. It doesn't mean we shouldn't share faith. But what the New Testament says all the way through is now that you are in Christ Jesus, this is what it means for you, and it starts in the way you live your life with other followers of Jesus Christ the way that you interact with other believers. Uh, in fact, in one point in the book of James, James said, if you say that you love God and you have this great relationship with God and you pray and you can fast and you, and you know how to move in spiritual gifts and you say you love God, but you don't love your brother, your brother, that's the person who follows Jesus in your own church community, he said, you're a liar and the truth is not in you. You're not living in the truth. Uh, these people that say, well, I've got a great prayer life, I seek the Lord, but I really don't want to be a part of the church, and I, people, Christians bother me. Uh, they're at a low level of maturity. Because to really be a mature Christian means that I've learned to love God, and the way that I demonstrate that love for God isn't just in the hours I spend praying or the amount of time I sp spend out on my own. It's when I come out of that place with God, I now go into intentionally into relationship with other believers and love them and serve them and bless them. Now, there's another thing that I want to mention. Uh, we are charismatic Christians. We believe that the Holy Spirit and his gifts are available to everyone today. And in the New Testament, there are three great sections that teach about spiritual gifts. The first is Romans chapter 12, and in Romans 12, there's a mention of gifts of the Spirit. Uh, it mentions seven particular different gifts, and then another one is in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and there we have an additional uh, nine spiritual gifts, and then at the end of chapter 12, there's a few other gifts that are mentioned. Uh, and then a third section would be Ephesians chapter 4 and verses 11 and 12. And without going into all of these gifts, what's important to recognize is that in all three of these uh, sections that talk about our supernatural gifts as Christians, there's no instruction in it about utilizing our gifts for people outside of the church. As a matter of fact, it's so strongly stated that the gifts that are given to the believer are first for other believers in the body of Christ. Now, that's amazing. That doesn't, mean we, that doesn't mean we shouldn't operate in our spiritual gifts and that God doesn't give people to minister to people who don't yet know the Lord. Absolutely, I'm not saying that. But I'm saying that if you look at what the New Testament teaches, it really says very little about using your spiritual gifts for the lost. What it does say, what it actually, and that's not, that's not because it's wrong, but it's telling us that the gifts of the Spirit are first and foremost to the believer for the believer that we're supposed to be learning to flow in those gifts of one another. And when Paul is writing a very long letter, a very long section uh, to the Corinthians, who was a group of Christians who had a lot of spiritual gifts, they knew how to prophesy and they saw and they had words of wisdom and words of knowledge and all kinds of spectacular supernatural abilities. And when Paul writes to them, he says, listen, your gifts are great. You don't fall short in any of the spiritual gifts, but you have a problem. 
And the problem is you don't know how to love each other. In fact, there is strife, there is envy, there is division. And when you read 1 Corinthians, Paul has to start talking about all of the problems that they had with each other. They were suing each other. They weren't morally living in a clean way with each other. They were resenting each other. They were dividing according to who they thought was right, their favorite, uh, their favorite speaker or communicators. They, they literally were completely all over the place. And Paul has to constantly direct them and tell them, listen, you have to get this right. You have to get this right. If you have arguments, you need to solve it within the family. And then finally he gets to chapter 11 and he talks about how they took communion. They were so selfish that when it came time to receive communion and they were all together, that folks would, would run to the communion wine and drink it until there was hardly anything left for the others. And people would eat their meal. They didn't wait for everybody to be served and receive it as a community event together. They just kind of forgot about the other person and everybody ran forward to get their their sacraments before anybody else could. And Paul says, this is really, really bad. I mean, even in the Lord's table, you're not recognizing the importance and the value of everyone that's present. That tells us something. There is a balance between my individual responsibility for myself, which is true, and my taking care of me, and as a Christian, my awareness of my responsibility to notice the needs of others and to care for them as well. It's not enough for me to just focus on me, and make sure I got my job and my education and my, my things, my needs met. As a believer, I not only need to believe for my needs, but I need to always keep an eye on others so that we're all blessed because if one member suffers, we're all suffering. And if one member rejoices, we should all rejoice. There is a sense of social responsibility in the New Testament. And so having said that, go through, and I want to challenge you to do this, go through the book of Ephesians, write down all of the different statements of of directives do this, do this, do this, do this. You'll find very little statements about your prayer life. There are some. Very little statements about how to develop this highly powerful, spiritually gifted life. But you'll find lots of statements about how to treat other people, how you should act with other people. And the reason for that is this. The way as a Christian that we practice our love for Jesus is not so much by developing a robust worship life, independent private worship life, but it's by recognizing the needs and the presence of others and loving them proactively. It is in extending the love of Jesus to others. In fact, uh, just listen to this, go through the New Testament letters and look at everything that talks about prayer, everything. This is remarkable. There are actual prayers in the New Testament. There's a a long prayer in Ephesians 1. There's a long prayer in Ephesians chapter 3. There's a prayer in Colossians chapter 1. Uh, Go through and look at these prayers. And also, there are statements about what to pray for in Ephesians 6. The vast majority of the things that we are directed to pray for has to do with other people. Now, we should pray for our own needs. We need to learn how to pray and believe God for healing, for our needs to be met. But the majority of what God tells us to do in our prayer life has to do with praying for one another. This is why it's so important for us to recognize. Because we're living right now in a world that is so focused on rugged individualism, so focused on me and mine and my suffering. And there's a lot of fear right now because there is uncertainty in the world that I, I see often in the body of Christ and Christians this, this uh, almost same spirit that's on the world getting into the body where people are attacking each other, dividing from each other, walking in fear and not recognizing our power as the body of Christ. Is to, and, and I'm gonna tell you something, our power, our power in this world is directly related to the love that we walk in. And that's what I want to talk to you about. Because if we don't get this love thing right, we are going to open ourselves up. I'm talking about followers of Jesus to the enemy in ways that you cannot imagine. Satan, at his core, is a divider. 
He is a divider of people. He's a divider of relationships. And he wants to divide your trust and confidence away from God and other people. This is exactly how he's worked from the beginning. When Satan wanted a throne that wasn't his, he began to talk to other angelic beings and secured their support. The Bible says there was a rebellion in heaven and it started with Satan dividing some of God's angelic beings against God himself. You see, when you have division, you have a loss of authority and a loss of power. And so, and so Satan, when he came into the garden, there was this beautiful earth and, and, and Adam and Eve the human parents, we were given authority in this earth. We were the caretakers of this earth. And how? And Satan had no way to bring sickness or pestilence, disease and, and death into this world, except he had to divide. So what did he do? First he went to Eve and he divided Eve against God, got her to distrust God. And then she acted outside of God's purpose, which was a violation of love. And as soon as she acted outside of love, darkness filled her soul. Satan could have access to her soul. And then she went to her husband. And instead of, instead of loving him and recognizing that she had sinned and asking for his, his prayer and supplication, she, she uh, used, uh, persuaded him to follow her. And she divided him against God. And then when he sinned, what's amazing is, not only did it divide them against the Lord, it divided them against one another. The next thing we see is God comes on the scene to restore. And what do we find? Adam is blaming Eve. They're no longer united. You see, united in sin is just another way of dividing us from one another. And then that division continued. Adam and Eve had two sons. And what happened? One son became jealous of the other. And one son killed the other. Violence. And as we see uh, the world progress until we get to Genesis uh, chapter 6, we see that the thoughts of men's hearts were continuously filled with what? Violence. What is violence? I want to hurt you. That is when humans are divided against humans. There was, uh, there was all of the great sins of the human race are sins of violation and violence and me not recognizing and honoring the other. And so I'm going to take from you or I'm going to use you or I'm going to ignore you. And all of these things break down the one ingredient that holds the entire universe together in harmony love. In the first cause, if we could have one principle that exists that describes God in his purest form, it is this, God is love. He doesn't just have love, he is love. Perfect unity. And so Satan is a divider of relationships. That's how he seeks to gain authority over people, by dividing and so love is the only thing that can conquer the wickedness of Satan. And so if Satan is going to attack Christians, if he's going to come against you and I once we've accepted the love of God, his greatest strategy is through division. He's going to try to get us to divide from one another. Listen to this verse. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 8, the Apostle Paul said this, But let us live in the light... Let us who live in the light be clear-headed, protected by the armor of faith and love. Listen to these words. Protected by the armor of faith and love. Do you know there is protection for you? There is protection for you in your covenant with God. There is protection for you physically from sickness and disease. There's protection from, for you emotionally and relationally from the torments that come upon us. There's protection for us in our relationship with God. And it, but it is an armor that we have to wear. And notice that armor, that protection is faith, which is our trust in God, and love, which is our relationship with God and others. And we can have, say, all the faith in the world. You can, know, you can know a lot of Bible verses, speak them well. You can confess the word of God. But if you're not walking in love, you've lost part of your armor. You've lost part of your protection. And I'm going to say this. One of the reasons that many believers have 
persistent and terrible things happen to them. I'm not saying every bad thing that happens is a result of this, but one of the things that you need to check is love. If you are walking in unforgiveness, if you are walking in bitterness, if you have a divided heart against another person, you need to deal with that. If you're carrying anger, and I'm going to talk about this because right now there's a lot of anger in the world, and some of it is rooted in just in injustice or things that are unjust, but I'm going to say this to you. As a believer, you are not supposed to walk around with that kind of anger in your heart. You are not. And don't use the one verse in the scripture, Ephesians chapter 5, that says, it says, be angry and sin not as an excuse to live angry. That's not what it's teaching. It says actually in the Greek, in your anger, don't sin and don't let the sun go down on your wrath. What is it saying? He's not saying it's a, a sin to be angry, but he says, when you have anger, don't act in sinful ways with it and don't let it sit in your heart for more than a day. That's what he says. Don't let the sun go down in your wrath. Don't go day after day after day. So I'm, my counselor says I'm supposed to sit in this anger. I'm sorry. Your counselor may be trying to get you in touch with something you've been denying, and I get that. But for the mo I'm going to go with the word here. The word says you're not supposed to let that sit in you for day after day after day. And there's a reason. It erodes your soul. It neurologically affects your brain. Anger in the brain, there's all kinds of research shows, it is more hurtful than helpful. It hurts your cortisol levels, it hurts your health, it hurts your ability to think clearly. Anger initially gives you brilliant clarity, but it doesn't give you perspective. It shuts off the part of your brain that can think reasonably. And that is why we are not supposed to sit in anger. Only God can hold anger and keep it in perfect balance. We weren't designed to. So that's not what my counselor will tell you. Well, I'm telling you that's what the Bible says. Anger isn't sinful, but it is not. you're supposed to handle it like fire. You recognize it, own it, give it to God, and keep tossing it. Don't take it to your bosom. Can a man take fire to his bosom and not get burned? You are not supposed to hold on to that for long periods of time. It will corrupt the way that you think. And it'll, this is the most important thing. It'll destroy your love. Because you'll no longer see the people or person you're angry at in the, cons, in the, in the, in the, cons, uh, in the construct of God's love. You'll just see them as an object of derision. And when you do that, you're out of the place of mercy. God can hold anger at somebody for a long period of time. You're not supposed to. But the Bible tells you you're supposed to give that up to the Lord and pray for them. And the faster you get to the pray for them, the better it is for you. And the better it will be for them in the long run. Now, listen to this. It says, we're protected by the armor of faith and love and wearing as our helmet the confidence of our salvation. In Jude verse one, chapter one and verse 20, it says, but you beloved, building yourself up in your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourself in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. You're supposed to be, he says, praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourself in the love of God keep yourself. You, and, and one of the ways we do that is by praying in the Spirit. When there are things happening that are upsetting us and, and, and frustrating us, sometimes you just got to turn off, shut down, put away all the stuff that's ginning up our anger, and just start praying in the Holy Ghost until we get back into a place of love. Love. That doesn't mean denial. I don't, I don't, I'm not suggesting you deny anything. You can see something and feel angry about it and say, that is injustice, that's wrong. But then you need to get back to a place where you start praying in the Spirit and say, Father, you're, you're more angry at injustice than I am. Show me how I can be a part of a solution. And get back into a place where love, because love will be the perspective that will help you to make the best decision. In 1 John 2.10, it says, He who loves his brother abides in the light, and there's no cause for stumbling in him. This is powerful. 
This is one of numerous places in the New Testament that indicates if we actually would develop a love life where we really walk in the love of God, there wouldn't be any cause for stumbling. Satan cannot get us. I'm going to tell you something. Real love throws out fear. Real love destroys pride and arrogance. Real love, when you get the love of God and you believe that that love is a protection, not a weakness, and you really develop the love of God for, for, for others and for yourself, uh, you're going to be in the best possible position to act wisely and judiciously and excellently. Love. This is the primary condition that we need to keep our hearts in. In 1 John chapter 3 and verse 22, it says this, And whatever we ask when we pray, we receive from him, because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. Now, that's important. We get answers to our prayers because we're keeping his commandments. But before you start thinking, okay, where are all the commandments that I got to keep? Listen to the next verse. And this is his commandment. This is what he's saying. There's lots of commandments, but if you do this one, it covers all the others. This is his commandment, that we should believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave us commandment. Faith and love. Remember the first verse? Faith and love are armors. It's an armor for us. He said, here's his commandment. Believe, have faith in God, and love one another. If you can't get anything else, if you just keep those two, you're going to walk in the will of God. I'm going to believe God. I'm going to walk in faith and not in fear. I'm going to learn what faith looks like, sounds like, feels like. I'm going to stay in a place of faith, and I'm going to stay in a place of love. And by the way, it's not one or the other, because one won't work without the other. It takes faith to walk in love, and you cannot have faith that works if you're not living in the love of God. Both of them need each other. The Bible says faith works by love. So that means love and faith are two sides. You've got to have them together. And you might have a lot of knowledge of the word and know how to believe, but if you're not walking in love, you're counteracting your own power and ability to, for your faith to work. In the same way, when you really want to love somebody, there are times you're going to have to let some things go, forgive people. You're going to have to love, and it takes faith to love because sometimes your feelings are not present. And faith isn't a feeling, faith is a force. Sometimes you just have to believe and act on the word of God when it comes to loving other people. And, but it's amazing, when you love by faith, the feelings will follow every single time. Notice again what he said, this is important, this is his commandment, to believe and to love. And if we do that, whatever we ask, we receive from him. That means we have power with God. Remember I said that you are powerful, the church is powerful, and our ability to get things done on the earth is powerful, but we have to make sure we're not losing that power by dividing ourselves up. And when we stop walking in faith and we stop walking in love, we lose our power in our homes, in our families, dealing with Satan in our lives, dealing with Satan in our, our, in our communities, and dealing with Satan in our nation. That's why the church of Jesus Christ, I don't, have, I don't have control over other churches, but this is the one church God's made me a steward. And I'm telling you, this is his word today. We need to be strong in faith and strong in love. And where we have stumbled in love, we need to get right back under the armor of love. Under the armor of love. Uh, notice this. It says in 1 John 5.18, we know that whoever is born of God does not practice sin. But he who's been born of God keeps himself, and the wicked one does not touch him. Now this keeps himself is very similar to what we just read, keeping yourself in the love of God. You see, when you keep yourself in the love of God, it makes it difficult for the enemy to cling to you. Now the word touch there actually is the Greek word that means to cling, to hang on to. All right, Satan cannot cling and hang on to you. It's almost like walking in love covers you with this oil. And, uh, and, and, and every time the devil tries to, to grab hold of you, he just can't, he can't hang on to you because the love of God makes it impossible for him to cling on to you. And believe me, if, I'm telling you, if, if, 
This is how Satan wants to get to your finances. This is how he wants to get to your marriage. This is how he wants to get to your kids, to your health, to your sense of well-being. He's going to try to do two things. Number one, get you in fear by showing you negative things and getting you to stop trusting the Word of God. Which means you hear something in the news and, 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 and fear comes and anxiety and pretty soon you're not at peace. You can tell you're, you're in fear when your peace is gone. And so he'll try to attack your faith and right along with that, he'll attack your love walk. He'll get you to notice someone that didn't remember your birthday or someone that was hurtful in the way they said something. Or he will, he will do some things that are hurtful against you and, 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 and it is legitimately painful. And what he wants to do is help you to notice these things, draw your attention to them, and get you out of a place of faith and love into a place of anger and fear. And once he gets you in those places, he's got you. Because you're not praying anymore. Not really. You're not praying with faith. And you're going to be pulling away from people. And once you pull away from people, the power of our agreement is reduced. And that's exactly what Satan is doing in the church right now. You know, the fact is that churches all over this country have begun to regather in certain parts of the country. And the sad fact is that the vast majority of those churches that are regathering uh, in larger numbers are having to shut down again because this crisis has not yet past. And we pray for those churches. I've been in contact with a lot of pastors who are in a difficult spot. The Lord hasn't led us to start physically regathering on campus yet, but as soon as he says so, we're going to do it. But I, I want to say this to you. This, this season where believers are not regularly aggregating together in a physical location in, lar in, in, our, in our regular numbers is a great test for us. It's a trial for us. Christians in church history and in Scripture have had tests like this before. And in these moments, the last thing we need to do is get in fear and get into a place of anger and division with other members of the body of Christ. And there are people who I believe some of them uh, will, uh, are used of the devil, some of them are just, are just, I think the devil's using them and they don't realize it. But they are, their voices are focused on getting believers to get filled with fear and filled with anxiety and filled with, with distrust towards others. And he's trying to divide us because I'm going to say something. Satan's greatest effort right now is to destroy the church of the Lord Jesus Christ because the only thing that holds back the great wickedness, the, and I talked this last Wednesday night, there is a, a mystery of lawlessness that's at work, and there is a man of lawlessness that someday will come. And the only thing that holds that back is the power of the Holy Spirit in the, in, in the local church that's walking in fellowship with one another and with God. And so we cannot buy into this strategy of Satan. We need to learn to talk to each other. That's what playing catch was all about. We need to listen to each other. That's an important strategy. But I want to talk about the spiritual core of what's happening. There is a demonic spirit or spirits that have been released in our nation. And I'm going to tell you something. It's not just about dividing people according to politics or according to race. Those things have always and will always happen. It's about dividing the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Dividing believers. If he can get us to pull away in faith from one another, to stop praying for one another, in this moment where we're vulnerable because we're not able to aggregate in large groups together, he is going to effectively diminish the, the, the voice of the body in the earth. And I'm here to tell you, I can't control what happens in every church, in every pastor, in every state, in every country. But I do have responsibility over this church over which the Lord has made me overseer. And I declare this right now in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ in my office as a pastor and in the office of the prophet that he allows me to stand in from time to time. I declare that, that this, uh, uh, this, mm, this effort to bring division and to, bring, uh, to break the love of God and to break the faith of the believer, I call this thing defeated in the name of Jesus. Satan, take your hands off the body of Christ. Take your hands off the church of the Lord Jesus Christ in this nation 
in this city, in this congregation. Take your hands off the families in the body of Christ. For Satan has sought to divide husband from wife and parent from child. Satan has sought to divide people and separate them from their shepherds. Separate and divide people from one another. And I take authority over this spirit of division. I unmask you in the name of Jesus. I command these seducing spirits that have been released to whisper and divide. I command you to be revealed in the name of Jesus. I pull back your mask. Let you be seen for who you are in the name of Jesus Christ. I speak to the Holy Spirit that resides and dwells in the spirit of every believer that's listening to me right now, every truly born-again believer. I say greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. I declare that you have one, an anointing that is in you, the Holy Spirit, and he teaches you all things. And I call for the Spirit of God to rise up past all of that brain that's been addled with news reports and addled with conspiracy theories and addled with fear. I command all the voices of the world to wither, to drop, to fall away in the name of Jesus. And I command right now the voice of the Spirit that is in you to rise up greater and stronger. I speak to the love of God that's in your spirit, the love of God that can out fear the love of God that is greater than all of our sin the love of God that brings clarity and peace and unity and the love of God that brings power and I command that love to be stirred up on the inside of you in the name of Jesus just take your hands and put your hands right here on your belly and just say I speak to the love of God moms and dads kids you do it too Just put your hands on your belly and say, I speak to the love of God that has been poured out in my heart. Love of God, rise up. Rise up. I'm not filled with hate. I'm not filled with strife. I renounce fear. I renounce fear. I renounce jealousy. I renounce hate. I command every spirit and voice that has been deceiving me to leave me now in the name of Jesus. I claim my full deliverance. I'm born of God. Jesus lives in my heart. I walk in perfect love. Now I want you to do something else. I'm just going to teach you on this. I didn't even get to it. Unforgiveness is like cancer to your armor of love. And, and, and unforgiveness is when you hold on to something, a wrong that has happened, either perceived or real, and you hang on to it yourself, and you hang on to the emotion of anger that's connected with that and hang on to a desire to see that person pay for that. The Bible says, do not take vengeance. Vengeance is mine. The Bible says to forgive fully and completely, which means you let go of that offense. You're not saying it wasn't, it, it, it wasn't a real offense, but you're saying, I'm not going to be the person that's going to exact the toll. I'm going to give them what they don't deserve forgiveness and love because I've needed forgiveness and love in my life so I'm going to release that person to God like a balloon you give it to God then God takes it and he brings the only he's the only one that can bring perfect justice so you need to let those things go right now it could be somebody you're married to somebody you're living with it doesn't mean you're justifying a real wrong that might have happened that may have been wrong and you could acknowledge this wrong but you're not going to hang on to the justice of it. You're going to let God hold the justice peace and you're going to seek to forgive them. You're going to see that person as someone that was trapped by the devil. Even if they did it intentionally, they knew what they were doing. They wouldn't have done it. What did Jesus say to the ones that were crucifying him on the cross? He said, Father, forgive them 
They weren't there saying, oh Jesus, I'm sorry that I, I whipped you. I'm sorry that I stuck a crown of thorns on your head. Oh, I'm really sorry that I stabbed you in the side. I'm so sorry I ripped the skin off your body. You're the son of God. I'm so sorry I nailed you to the cross. Will you free? No, they weren't doing that. They were mocking him. They were spitting on him. They not only were, had murdered him or were murdering him, they were not repentant at all. And while they were still in that condition, what did Jesus say? Father, forgive them for they know not what they do I'm going to say something even people that are evil and intend to be evil they're, they're insane if they really knew what they were doing they really knew how damaging it was to them what a lie it is that they believed they could see the truth of the light of God they'd fall on their face and repent People are evil because they're deceived. Doesn't make what they do right. Doesn't mean you shouldn't feel anger. What it means is, Father, forgive them. You're the only one that can hold anyone accountable fully. Forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing, not really. I want you to do that right now. I want you to do that for your husband, for your wife, for your children, for your parents, for your grandparents, for your abusers for your boss, for your coworker, for the person that didn't love you the way they should have, for the person that, that hurt you and injured you intentionally. I want you to do that for the politicians you despise. I want you to do that right now for the people you didn't vote for and would never vote for. I want you to do that right now for every person in the body of Christ who's called you a name. If you're in law enforcement, I want you to do that for every person that's ever spit on you and called you a name and judged you unrighteously. If you're a person of color and you feel untreated, I want you to do this for every person that's treated you poorly, every person that's hurt you, every person that's judged you. I want you to do it not because you you, you haven't been wrong, but because Jesus calls you to do it. Father, I want you to do it for this nation filled with sins and lots of mistakes. Father, forgive them. Say it with me. Father, forgive them. For they know not what they do. They're acting in deception. Just say this, Father, I forgive them. I release them to you. You keep the books. You're the only one who can judge perfectly. I'm no longer going to be waiting for their judgment. I'm not going to relish in their pain. And Father, I pray that you would open the eyes of everyone that has hurt me. Say this. I pray that you open the eyes of everyone that has hurt me. Let them see what they need to see so they can change. Let them experience your perfect love. Now, Father, help me to build bridges of love in the body of Christ. Forgive my words that have been divisive. Clean my mind from all the voices that have moved me out of love and faith. I put myself under the armor of love and faith, which is my protection. In Jesus' name, amen. Something just happened. I mean, you feel that? Something powerful, something spiritual just happened. Satan is not happy about this moment. That's okay. You don't have to be afraid of him. All you get, and say, well, what if, what if I mess up? Listen, the key, if you stumble, just get up, get yourself under the, in faith, go to God, receive his mercy. The biggest thing about the mercy of God, just make sure you're giving it to others. The only way you don't receive the mercy of God is when you withhold it from others. That's why you have to cl clean the slate, forgive everyone, because you're going to need some mercy.
And we all need grace to live in this time. I'm telling you right now, God has done something today in this church, in us. Now let's stay in this place of the love of God. Let's build on this. We're still in the midst of a battle in a nation, in this world. There are yet things that could come to pass. And we need to prepare, but listen, not in fear. We prepare in faith, we prepare in love, because God is not finished with the body of Christ. And in Jesus' name, we push back the darkness with faith and love today and every day. Amen. If you would like to, if you'd like to know more, we'd love to hear from you. There's a little section on on many of the, uh, the sites that we're uh, broadcasting on. If you hit raise your hand, we'd love to send some information, get to know who you are, pray for you. We have a free app called Abundant Life Syracuse in your app store. Just download it full of all kinds of resources that can be a blessing to your life. Uh, a lot of folks are watching on our YouTube channel. If you're doing that, make sure to subscribe and like, share it with others if it's been a blessing to you. We wanna get the word out to others of what God is doing. Uh, in this earth through the body of Christ and through through Abundant Life. Thank you so much for being a part. Abundant Life family, we love you. Uh, I cannot wait for the day that we are worshiping together again soon and very soon. In the meantime, we're not afraid and we're full of love and we know the best is yet to come. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you, make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May he lift up his countenance, his face upon you and give you peace. And may something great happen in your life this week in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Thanks again so much for joining us today. Wasn't that an incredible service? We want to remind you, don't forget, you can connect with us throughout the week by downloading our app and listening to our podcast. You can even visit our YouTube channel. And whether you're new to Abundant Life or you've been coming for a while and want to learn more about our ministry, just text the word NEXT to 315-888-5332. We'll get you connected to all the ways that you can grow deeper in your faith and discover what's really next for you here at Abundant Life. And if God has impacted your life through this ministry, we invite you to partner with us financially to help us to continue to reach people throughout our world and community. Head on over to alcclife.org slash give or use the giving tab on our app to choose the best giving option that works for you. Thanks again for joining us today and we pray that you continue to experience a more abundant life and experience something great in your life.